Hello and welcome to this week's View on Africa, focusing on the recently concluded Assembly of States Parties to the Rome Statute that was convened in The Hague between 16 and 24 November. I am Otilia Anamanganidze, an acting program head as well as senior researcher in the Office of the Executive Director here at the Institute for Security Studies. What I will be talking to you about today is what was discussed at the Assembly of States Parties but quite importantly, also addressing the elephant in the room, which relates to um, three withdrawals by African states from the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, namely by South Africa, Burundi, as well as the Islamic Republic of the Gambia. In discussing this, one of the key questions that often comes up is what actually happens to those people who are longing for justice if uh, countries withdraw from the Rome Statute, but also if they don't lend their full support to the, to the mission of promoting international criminal justice. One of the key issues that I will focus on is some of the issues raised by African states at the Assembly of States Parties in terms of their concerns regarding the International Criminal Court, but more specifically regarding the international criminal justice system. In saying that these concerns were raised by African states parties, it is important to note that not all countries were on the same page in terms of issues around withdrawal, but also in terms of issues around how best to engage with the International Criminal Court. The five main issues uh, that have been raised over the past couple of years, but quite prominently at the recent Assembly of States parties, are the uneven landscape of international criminal justice, the indictment of sitting heads of state, the abuse of universal jurisdiction, as well as the need to ensure regional justice mechanisms such as through the African court. And lastly, whether or not African countries will take up the responsibility and actually enable domestic justice processes. I will speak about these key issues in, in turn, given that they are issues that were raised by a number of African countries, as well as countries from elsewhere in the globe, uh, at the Assembly of States Parties to the Rome Statute. So first on the uneven landscape, two key issues come up. One is the role of the UN Security Council in the work of the International Criminal Court. While this has been, an, uh, while the role of the UN Security Council is part and parcel of the Rome Statute and has seen the UN Security Council refer Sudan as well as Libya to the International Criminal Court, uh, African countries have raised this uh, decision by the UN Security Council to refer certain situations while not referring, for example, the situation in Syria or the then occupied territories of Palestine to the ICC. While this is a sound criticism coming from the uh, African states, it really relates more to how the UN Security Council functions over how the ICC does. And so in speaking about efforts towards reforming the International Criminal Court, there ought to be recognition also that this is part of a broader conversation around reforming the United Nations and quite specifically the functioning of the UN Security Council. The next then, which is directly re related to the International Criminal Court, is how the ICC selects cases. At the moment, even though the International Criminal Court has had a number of referrals or attempts at referrals by states outside of Africa, all of the cases before the International Criminal Court do arise from African situations. The International Criminal Court is investigating the situation in Georgia, but this remains a situation that they have not yet opened cases for. And so as it stands, all of the cases before the International Criminal Court are African. The allegation there by a number of African states including most recently at the Assembly of States Parties by Burundi, is not only are you targeting African leaders, but you're targeting African criminal justice systems. This is an issue that is worth discussing, particularly because there is recognition that crimes are not only being committed on the African continent. What is interesting now is that the International Criminal Court has announced that it could be opening an investigation into uh, Afghanistan, but also some recent pronouncements on the possibility of investigations into the Philippines. The next then, and which is one of the major bones of contentions from the African Union and some African states, is the issue of charging sitting heads of state. In the situation in Darfur, Sudan, 
uh, the International Criminal Court, amongst its indictees, has charged the president of Sudan, Omar San al-Bashir, for crimes against humanity, war crimes, and genocide. Al-Bashir remains at large because countries uh, in part refuse to cooperate with the International Criminal Court in his arrest. Their argument is that as a head of state, he ought to be immune from prosecution. One of the discussions at this Assembly of States parties was should Article 27 of the Rome Statute relating to the ICC's jurisdiction that removes immunity be amended? But at the same time, should Article 98, which allows for states to, to essentially um, apply their domestic laws and have agreements with other states in respect of the immunity provision, should that be amended? And what would that amendment look like? While some countries were quite keen for a conversation on immunities, the overwhelming majority of countries were of the view that there should not be immunity of, from prosecution in respect of war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, recognizing that often these are crimes that are committed through the state apparatus. The second issue around the indictment of heads of state is around the peace versus justice debate. This is particularly uh, relevant for at least South Africa, that in submitting their instrument of withdrawal to the UN Secretary General, they raised the issue of peace as their primary motivator for this withdrawal. They argued that for as long as al-Bashir, for example, is indicted, and for as long as people are not afforded their immunity, South Africa's efforts to establishing peace, particularly on the African continent, would not succeed. So therefore, South Africa argued that in withdrawing from the Rome Statute, they are moving more towards peace, even if it means moving away from justice. The third relates to the threat to sovereignty, arguing again that as head of state, um, this person embodies the sovereign nation and therefore should not be indicted. This was an issue raised by some African states, but at the same time, a range of African states, for example, Botswana, Burkina Faso, and Ghana, argued that while states are sovereign by submitting themselves to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, um, by submitting themselves to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, they would in effect, um, they would in effect uh, be allowing for the International Criminal Court to have some power at least over even those who are sitting heads of state. The next is the issue around the abuse of universal jurisdiction. While this is not a concern directly targeted at the International Criminal Court, it is a concern that has been raised in respect of other countries invoking universal jurisdiction in order to be able to prosecute uh, a range of people that are from uh, African countries. The third is now, should the African court be expanded to allow for it to be the African criminal court and for the ICC to not serve that function? While this is a, a serious issue under consideration, given that heads of state adopted the protocol amending the African court statute, allowing for them to be able to deal with, uh, with international crimes, no African countries as yet has ratified this protocol which means until that happens, the International Criminal Court is still uh, the only hope bar the domestic jurisdiction um, in respect of international crimes. The fourth, the, the fifth, sorry, and essentially the, the, the last point in terms of some of the key issues of concern is if the International Criminal Court really wants to promote international justice, then what it ought to be doing is to be supporting domestic justice processes as much as possible. But the question here is that, is that the responsibility of the International Criminal Court or should International Criminal Court itself uh, sim simply serve to complement the jurisdiction of na nation states with nation states essentially doing their own job? But what does it mean to actually enable domestic justice processes? It means that countries, not just the ones that are member states to the Rome Statute, but even those that aren't, ought to criminalize war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. By doing so, they ensure that the ICC serves as a complementary mechanism to domestic jurisdiction rather than the other way around. Second, which is quite important, is within the Rome Statute, the International Criminal Court ought to only intervene where states parties are either unable or unwilling to prosecute. 
So where states parties say they're unable, but they are willing to prosecute, the question then is how do you ensure that ability? This involves capacity building on the part of states themselves. The International Criminal Court can support such initiatives through, for example, helping in terms of providing information on how to deal with these prosecutions, but also on how the International Criminal Court has dealt with investigations of this nature. The third really relates to the role, particularly of civil society, not only in advocacy, but also in engaging with states in terms of ensuring that there is that willingness. So once you've established the ability to prosecute, you also ought to have the willingness to do so. In South Africa, for example, it has primarily been at the, um, as a result of litigation by civil society that the South African government in many respects has been forced to wake up to the need to ensure accountability for international crimes. And this also recognizes that often in the prosecution of international crimes is not the primary uh, response, uh, not the primary responsibility, but a major priority for some governments. For example, Namibia argued that they would rather focus on issues around poverty alleviation first before they deal with issues around the prosecution of international crimes. But should one be foregone in order to, to do the other, or can they be done at the same time? And what role can civil society play to ensure that government is able to perform those functions? So it's not just about advocacy or court action. It also involves technical assistance on the part of civil society organizations to develop the capacity, but also the willingness uh, of African states as well as states elsewhere. But where does this really leave the International Criminal Court? Well, first, and perhaps worth repeating, the International Criminal Court remains a court of last resort. What that means is for the most part, it should be a court that is complementary to national jurisdictions, but the International Criminal Court ought to commit to justice as much as it calls on states to do that. That might, that might mean that the International Criminal Court ought to invest more in being fairer, more effective and equitable. The arguments that are raised by African states, not only at this recent Assembly of States parties, but at meetings before that around fairness and equitability as well as effectiveness are not arguments that ought to be dismissed. What does fair justice look like? It looks uh, at issues across the globe being dealt with, not just African situations. But ultimately, it's more about the ICC actually doing its work. The only way the International Criminal Court can demonstrate this fairness is by actually showing it through its processes. It means transparent as well as accountable investigations, as well as prosecutions, and it means that the judges also um, serve their functions as fairly and as openly as possible. But it also means that the ICC should seriously consider not leaving Africa, but looking at situations outside of Africa as well. What that means is justice ought to be served for African victims as much as the victims, for example, in situations in Syria or elsewhere on the globe. That is not a task left only to the International Criminal Court. It is a task that the United Nations Security Council ought to also seize itself with. But at the same time, and this is an important message coming from the Assembly of States parties, is the only way the International Criminal Court can do that is if states continue to support its work, not only through statements of support, but also through budgetary support. At the same time, it means that as states are meeting their obligations to prosecute international criminal, uh, international criminal uh, crimes, that they are also supporting the work of the International Criminal Court more tangibly. So ultimately, at least the message coming out of the ASP is even though countries mourn the withdrawal of South Africa, Burundi and the Gambia, the move to ensure universal ratification has never been stronger. And at least on the African, on the African continent, countries like Botswana, Burkina Faso, Ghana, Lesotho, Mali, Nigeria, Tunisia, Senegal, and Cote d'Ivoire have reiterated their support for international criminal justice. And perhaps those countries will remain.